Well, welcome to our fourth episode of Impact Show. So excited to be here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Frank LaFerla, Dean of the Biological Sciences School here at the University of California, Irvine. Frank, I've been so excited to interview you. In fact, when I came up with the show series, one of the topics I really wanted to hit was, you know, around the whole uh, ideology of mental illness, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, all the work that you've been doing and what I've learned about the work that you've been doing over the years. And being one of the leading researchers of this topic, uh, it's an honor to have you. As you know, the IMA network is vast, it's large, there's mm -hmm. professionals all around the world. You were kind enough to speak on our stage in Las Vegas in September in front of hundreds of chief marketing officers. And while we're you know, behind the desk and working in marketing, we're also humans at the end of the day and we have access to large databases, whether it's our employees or networks that we're all part of. And I really believe the topic of mental illness, uh, the topic of dementia, Alzheimer's, it touches virtually every IMA member because I know people in my own family and community. And it's just an honor to have you here. So I think what we like to do at the beginning is really just get to know a little bit more about you, our subject. So maybe you could tell us your background, how you, where you grew up and how you arrived to what you do here at UCI. Okay, uh, thanks Sinan, it's great to be here with you and I've enjoyed all my associations with you as well. And it was wonderful to speak in Las Vegas as part of your IMA conference. Uh, so I am the son of immigrants. My parents were both born in Sicily. So I was the first one in my family to go to college. I grew up in uh, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And uh, like many first generation students, uh, my parents wanted me to be either a doctor, lawyer, or engineer. And so when I went to college, I went with the intention that I was going to become a, a medical doctor. Right. And then uh, something unusual happened to me in college. And at the end of my second year, I got paid actually to work in a laboratory and to conduct research. Oh. And I just fell in love with it. And I realized at that moment that discovery was going to be my passion and was the path I should follow. And did that come from family or a generation above you? I mean, what, what, how did research just, just open your mind and, and, and you knew in that moment this is what you wanted to yeah. do? Yeah, so generally first generation immigrants sure. don't want their uh, you know, children to be academics. Right. They, you, the idea that you can make a living from uh, discovery you know, it was not something that was on the radar, let's put it that way. Whereas being a physician is much more practical, it's much more relatable. And so uh, my parents were a little upset when I decided to go and pursue a PhD rather than an MD. Right. right. And so tell us about your journey and how you arrived to UCI and some of the research that you've been working on. Yeah, so I uh, started off studying viruses, mm -hmm. and when I went to graduate school, uh, I thought it was perhaps one of the best time to be studying viruses because HIV had just right. come on the scene. Right. What was that, like the 80s? Yeah. yeah. It was mid-80s, uh, 1985. It was just identified that HIV was the major cause of AIDS. So uh, I thought from that time, from that perspective, wow, you know, the most important virus to ever I impact mankind right. was just being identified, and I was going to work on that. And it turns out that a lot of individuals who suffer from uh, AIDS Develop dementia. And oh, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, a lot okay. of people are surprised to find out about that. And so the the virus tends to also have these neurotrophic effects, meaning that it impacts the brain or the right. nervous system. So I was interested in studying how HIV would lead to dementia. And I went to this laboratory at the American Red Cross. And when I got there, for whatever reasons, things changed and said, sure. I want you to work on Alzheimer's. Have right. you ever heard of Alzheimer's? I'm like, barely. It's like, too bad, learn about it. And so that's right. how I got into the field. I always tell people, it found me rather than me finding it. Right. The AIDS virus, I mean, I remember in the 80s, I mean, I was much younger, uh, maybe in my teens, and I just remember that being sort of like this this scary thing. And it, it's amazing how much has developed, but there still is no cure, right? I mean, it, it's it's still... It's a, a more a, manageable a, disease. Right, right. Certainly, well, it's no longer a death sentence right. like it used to be right. in the 1980s. And there's always hysteria every time you talk about infectious diseases and right. we're living through it right now. Coronavirus, coronavirus right? right? I mean, that's our current affair right now. Right. Like, it's, it's out there. Yeah, exactly. And what are your thoughts on coronavirus? I mean, it, it seems like there's this internet shock of it, right? So yeah. there's this pandemic fear 
But then there's the realities, and I look at you know the flu and how many deaths are associated right. with that every year. Just any thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's uh, a, probably a little bit more pathogenic than the flu. Mm -hmm. Probably not as lethal as SARS was, so it's probably somewhere in, in, in the middle. Um, I think it's still early days, so we don't right. really understand how infectious it's going to be, and so it's mm -hmm. always best to err on the side of caution. And where do these viruses originate? I mean, looking at HIV as one and looking at coronavirus as another and, and SARS, you know, and, and these things that just manifest quickly, what originates that? Does yeah. it come from a plant, an animal? I yeah. mean, what, what's the origin of yeah. it? Yeah, so it's generally thought that there's some vertical transmission that certain species, uh, certain viruses can jump from one species to another. Oh. And so, you know, right. one of the leading hypothesis was that HIV was a monkey simian oh, right. um, right. this, you know, infection that somehow uh, was able to jump across species to uh, humans and the same thing is true uh, for I think coronaviruses and, and some of these other um, uh, infectious agents as well. A lot of them seem to begin in societies that have a very strong agricultural sure. connection, right, right. Um, like China, and then there's a, a lot of global travel there. Sure. You eat a lot of exotic foods, maybe like sure. bats and o other things, and as a result, it gets transmitted and then gets so widely disseminated because of all the global travel. And it kind of seems like this topic right here ties into the whole mantra of UCI Biological Sciences because one of your messaging is mind, body, world, which I think this speaks to very exactly. well. Right. Tell us a little bit about how you came up with mind, body, world and what that means for UCI right. and biological sciences. Yeah, so it developed very organically. As you know, I'm an Alzheimer's researcher and I'm the director of the Alzheimer's Center here as well as being dean. So I've interacted with a lot of members of the community and all of the seniors that I interact always have one message for me, mm -hmm. which is, Dr. LaFerla, you have to save my mind. Right. And in thinking about how do we you know, encapsulate what we do in the School of Biological Sciences, Sciences, I went back to those interactions with those individuals and realized that for most of us to have a healthy mind, we need to have a healthy body. To have a healthy body, we need to have a healthy world because life is interconnected. Right. And we can see with the warming of the oceans and the acidification of that, the coral reefs are becoming bleached in many areas throughout the world. And then, you know, fisheries are going to die. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, right. it's not far off. Sure. We've for humans are going to be impacted pretty severely. Right, right. And I mean, if you just look at, I mean, you're talking about the oceans. One of the things that comes to mind is just all the plastic that's going that's out right. to, to the ocean. Right. And um, it, it's astounding to see how that, that, like you said, the interconnection of it, because the plastic ends up, you know, in a fish, and then the fish is then eaten by a bird, then the bird dies, and then they find the plastic inside the and bird. So and so one of our researchers in the school does a lot of research on plastics in the ocean. And oh, really? it's really cool. So you generally think of plastics as being very buoyant and not sinking. But what happens is, as they become encrusted with viruses mm -hmm. and bacteria, right. they lose that buoyancy and they start to sink. Right. And her research, she's found that when the plastics be abut the coral reefs, they then transmit those viruses, fungi, mm -hmm. bacteria to the coral reef right. and cause them to die at an accelerated rate. Yeah, and you know, it seems like the world is taking on plastic the way that it took on smoking about a decade ago, and there seems to be such a convergence happening, at least in first world nations, and, right. and hopefully that's something that can be combated. Um, but I think when plastic came out, I saw some original commercials decades ago on how it was like the greatest thing in the world, right? But then decades later, this, this act after effect happens, right? So I, I think we're really taking a more organic approach to these new materials and substances that, that are being created, but that's an interesting uh, thought. You know, you, you, the comment you made about save my mind, you know, as a child growing up, I always thought of biology, physiology, you know, my physique and exercise and diet, but I never thought about my mind, right? my mind and the potential of that as I get older and hearing more and more people I know being diagnosed with Alzheimer's, dementia, the different types of, you know, there's just so much out there. Can you talk a little bit about the trends that are happening and how your research led into this area and, and some of the success that you've had, whether it was on mice, can you talk a little bit about 
all that. Yeah, so let me just uh, comment. So one of the most common questions I always get is asked is what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's right. disease? Mm -hmm. And the way I like to describe it is I think of dementia as a broad umbrella term in the same way that cancer is a broad umbrella term. Just like there are many different types of cancers, there are many different types of dementias. It turns out that Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia mm -hmm. and about 65% of all cases of dementia are due to the Alzheimer's type. Now, in the United States, there are about 5.8 million Americans that are impacted by Alzheimer's disease. And essentially, every 65 seconds, someone develops this insidious disorder in the United States. Mm -hmm. There are about 90,000 plus individuals in Orange County alone that suffer from Alzheimer's disease wow. because there are so many baby boomers here, and this is such a great sure. place to retire. Right. And it turns out that there are more people living with Alzheimer's in Orange County than there are in about 26 states in the United States. Wow. And so you mentioned earlier, uh, when you're younger, you didn't have to worry about this. Well, that's because you, when you're younger, you don't have to worry. Your mind works and functions right. very effectively. These are all age-related disorders. And we know that for Alzheimer's, for example, that one out of every 20 people over the age of 65 is affected, and wow. that number doubles every five years thereafter. So one out of 10 over the age of 70, one out of five over the age of 75, and essentially one out of every two to three people over mm -hmm. the age of 80 to 85 suffers from Alzheimer's wow. disease. And is that something that's hereditary or? So a small number of Alzheimer's cases are hereditary and transmitted from one generation to the other. Those generally tend to be rare. They only account for maybe 2% of all cases of Alzheimer's. Sure. They also tend to be the most aggressive forms mm. of the disease. But I think almost all forms of Alzheimer's disease are going to have some genetic component to it. Right. And so what are some early symptoms or how would you know if, if that was happening to you? Yeah. So um, it's interesting. Mo a lot of individuals who suffer from this realize that something's going on with their memory before it can actually mm -hmm. be confirmed through mm -hmm. a lot of the neuropsychological exams. Mm -hmm. And people just have no way of verifying that. And so sure. it leads to a lot of frustration for the patient because they're, they're feeling, my memory's just not working as well as it used to. Mm -hmm. But when you, we test them in, in a laboratory or in the clinic here, uh, they seem to do well. And right. so people perk up when they're about to get tested, sure. they pay attention more. And so they're, even though they feel like they have these memory issues, they're able to do quite well on these tests initially. So what are some of the uh, problems that people have initially? Well, things like managing their checkbook, forgetting a word in a sentence, forgetting the date and time. I always uh, like to point out that, you know, it's normal for all of us to forget things from time to time. If you go to the mall and forget where you park your car, mm -hmm. then that happens to all of us. Now, sure. if you forget that you drove your car to the mall, that's a little bit more severe. So right. it's a, a matter of degrees, I think. And those that suffer from Alzheimer's or, you know, a form of dementia, I'm sure it's hard for their spouse or the people that's with them because they, they, they slowly see this deterioration of that person, right? Can, right. can you explain that dynamic? Yeah, and so I, I, there's a couple things that are really difficult with that with dynamic. First of all, people's pay, uh, memories um, don't decline in a progressive, steady fashion. So it's not like a straight line. It looks like a seismic plot. Right. And it goes up and down. So you have good days followed by bad days. And that's very frustrating for families because one day, if a mom has Alzheimer's disease, she'll remember all the names of her children and her grandchildren, and the next day she'll have no idea who they are. Right. And then a couple of days later, remember who they are again. And so when you couple that to the fact that generally early on, their bodies look pretty much intact. Right. It's hard, I think, for those individuals to accept that something is going on, but there is a major cognitive dissonance that's going on right. in these um, individuals. So I think that's the first thing. Then it's the caregivers themselves are under tremendous amount of stress. And the only strong advice I can have for anyone caring for someone with Alzheimer's is to remember to do what the airlines tell you to do. Put your mask on before you help others put on theirs. You have mm -hmm. to take care of yourself. If you don't do that, you're not going to be any use right. to your loved one. Is there something our audience, with all the members of the IMA watching this, uh, that can be doing to prolong a potential diagnosis or to avoid you know this at all is it exercise eating fish any any recommendations you would have to kind of have that healthy body you know right. as you 
enter your 40s, 50s, 60s. Any, any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, so there's a lot of research, and it all more or less boils down to do what your mom told you to do. Uh, don't smoke. Mm -hmm. Don't drink excessively. Socialize. Uh, get, you know, um, eat healthy. Those kinds of right. things. So maintain a, a balanced, you know, healthy right. lifestyle. Exactly. So in a few moments, we're going to walk over to the lab and actually uh, view the brain. Okay. And um, in addition to Alzheimer's, any other types of dementias that you've researched or are looking at here at BioSci? Yeah. So uh, we've been uh, we study a lot of different types of dementias, uh, like frontal temporal dementia, which is a little bit different than Alzheimer's because it affects the frontal lobe as opposed to the temporal lobe. Uh, these individuals um, generally manifest the disorder a little bit younger than Alzheimer's patients. Right. And uh, since it affects the frontal lobe, have more disinhibition. Mm -hmm. We've also uh, created the first animal model for Lewy body dementia, right. which, mm -hmm. as you know, Robin Williams suffered sure. from right. that. Right. Those individuals tend to have a lot more hallucinations. Uh, and there's a lot of work being done here at UCI also on vascular dementia, which are probably the four big types of dementia, or at least age-related dementias. Right. And so given this, biological sciences is one of several schools here at UCI. Can you tell us a little bit about your footprint, how large you are, and yeah. your student base? Yeah. So uh, the School of Biological Sciences has about 130 full-time Senate faculty, about 30 additional uh, affiliated faculty. We have about 5,000 undergraduates and about 500 uh, graduate students. So, you know, we're the size of a small college. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, you're one of the greatest, most respected deans, and not just here at UCI, but in your field. Uh, it's been an honor to, to get to know you a little bit better, and excited to go check out the lab and, and look at a few more uh, stats up front. So why don't we Great. make that transition now? So Frank, I love coming to this campus. I mean, it's always beautiful and sunny in Southern California, but can you give me some orientation as to some of these beautiful buildings? Yeah, so the uh, campus is, is shaped like a circle, yeah. and so most of the STEM disciplines are located in this area. Uh, we're in the bioci quadrant, then uh, adjacent to us is physical sciences, and then after that is uh, engineering, okay. and in the opposite direction is where the humanities happen happen to uh, be located, then the central administration, social sciences, et cetera. Great. Yeah. And so all these were built by the state of California. So they're all behemoths. Uh, they're mainly research uh, uh, focused. They're all research right. labs. Right. And every now and then there's some uh, smattering of uh, classrooms that are located in the buildings as well. And then, of course, around the corner is probably the thing I'll be known for forever. Not what I did from research, but bringing a Starbucks to the BioSci Quadrangle, which turns out to be, it's turned out to be very popular. I'm sure. With the students, and you can see it's quite busy. Right. And in about uh, a half hour, it'll just be swarmed, <laughs> and you won't even be able to get to it. Because it's well, I mean, so what, what were students drinking 20, 30 years ago? I mean, well, the, uh, Starbucks. It, it's you know, just... the area here was uh, almost lifeless. I mean, yeah. uh, and so the Starbucks has turned out to be a magnet wow. to bring a lot of students here so that they could accidentally bump into faculty, faculty could bump into each other. Right. And, and I think that's where the magic I mean, happens. Did they honor you with a yeah, Frappuccino actually, drink named after you or something? I mean, that is a beautiful Starbucks, I gotta is, say. It is a very nice okay, Starbucks. Very and cool. uh, they actually put up a plaque there. Oh, which is a you got nice a plaque. Thing. Yeah, I have a plaque awesome. on the Starbucks. Great. And are you finding a trend of where the students are coming from for BioSci? I mean, is it East Coast, West Coast, or well, do you see any sort of schools, so yeah. there's a limit to how many could come from outside of this, the state of California. Right. No more than, I think, 19 or 20% okay. of the population could come from outside the state. And uh, uh, the campus is very proud of the fact that we have 50% uh, of our students are first generations, the first in their families to go to college. Oh, that's wonderful. And we're also designated as a, a Hispanic-serving institution. So oh, that's also very That's nice. great to know. Yeah. Okay, so Frank, tell me a little bit about memories in the making and this beautiful artwork you have here at BioSci. So all of this artwork was done by dementia patients, and it was a program that actually started in Orange County and has since gone globally. And the idea was to get patients who suffer from dementia to express themselves artistically. 
And what we're seeing uh, here are individuals who never painted before, mm -hmm. who now are given this opportunity, even in a demented state, to express themselves. And they do so very, um, you know, in a, uh, collaboratively, right. and I think in a very creative uh, manner. So this one here is uh, my favorite painting. It's called Into the uh, Pink Woods. Wow, and so beautiful. you can see. Um, fallen pink leaves and, and you know trees that, that have lost their leaves but to me it looks like a slice through the brain mm -hmm. so these are the neurons and these are the axons sure. and, and, and tell me a little bit about the expression of the art and and how the different pathways are working. I mean, how do you see a correlation there? Well, you know, there are different types of memory, right? You have uh, muscle memory, you have memory for music, right? That seems to be uh, a type of memory that lasts for a very long time. Even right. individuals who are suffering from dementia, right. their ability to respond to music that they like seems to be intact. Um, and these individuals never were artists before right, right. and now are expressing themselves creatively so that's oh, wonderful really nice. yeah. I love that yeah and so a benefactor had purchased all of these at auction and decided to give them to us because we get a lot more foot traffic than he I does in it. his basement that was wonderful. And, and here's then, some pioneers in neurology. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, a lot of people are surprised to find out that Alzheimer's was an actual German psychiatrist and, um, and that the disease is named after him. And his first patient was August Dieter. Uh, she was actually 51 years old at the time this photo was taken and she was suffering from severe um, memory deficits and that's why I went to Dr. Alzheimer's uh, clinic. And then they're arranged in a certain order. So for example, uh, almost everyone with Down syndrome develops Alzheimer's disease by the time they're in their 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's in this order. Got it, so Parkinson, right. Huntington. And you know, Got it. A lot of Alzheimer's patients have Parkinsonian type tremors. People with Parkinson's can develop dementia as well. Great. So we had uh, Dr. LaFerla give us a whole tour and overview of biological sciences, and he's been gracious enough to bring us into the lab in which Andrea Wasserman is the head of. So can we talk a little bit about your background and, and your role here? Certainly. So I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for UCI MIND and I have uh, been here 30 years at UCI and my whole tenure has been within the Institute. Uh, I truly love working here, uh, especially doing uh, things with the community and talking about Alzheimer's disease. Um, so awesome. happy to show you today you. a brain. Yes. Um, so um, this is a brain that's been donated to us um, well over a decade ago by a woman who died in her early 70s of natural causes. Um, this is not an Alzheimer's brain, mm -hmm. and we reserve all of those brains for research purposes. Okay. So real quickly, we'll just talk about the brain. Um, in particular, what I want to point out, the front part of the brain here, which we call the frontal cortex, um, and the frontal cortex is responsible for executive decision making and also for controlling our inhibitions. Right. Um, there is a type of dementia called frontotemporal dementia, and it's this part of the brain that gets affected. Okay. People normally present with having a hard time um, doing things with numbers right. and also sort of behaving inappropriately. Okay. Right? Um, so that's one area of the brain. The other side of the brain here is broken up into three lobes. We have occipital, parietal, and temporal lobes. Um, and also what we'll do is we'll turn this around so you can see the underneath part of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, so here, just some interesting structures we'll point out. Um, this is the optic nerve, okay. which is for your eyes. And it's shaped like an X because the left side of the brain controls the right and right controls left. And you said this is not an Alzheimer's brain. Correct. Um, and what, how would an Alzheimer's brain uh, look or feel different? Right, so a uh, fully developed human brain weighs about three pounds. Mm -hmm. Someone with Alzheimer's disease, their brain can shrink to half this size. So okay. quite devastating, there's a lot of atrophy. And so what happens is that if you look at the top of the brain, these areas, these raised areas, actually shrink and get very skinny, and the spaces in between get very wide. And it's usually pretty clear um, upon autopsy mm -hmm. 
that a person may have had the disease for quite a long time. Understood. And if, uh, you know, people who suffer trauma or car accident and, and that sort of trauma on the brain, the, the opposite happens, correct? The expansion of it and, and what type of effects happen there? Sure, it really depends. So if you're talking about a situation maybe where someone's had a concussion, right? right? So a concussion is actually a bruise on the brain. Okay. And um, our brains actually float in a fluid, mm. right? So when someone has a concussion, basically what's happened is that the brain has hit the inside of the skull right. very hard. I see. So depending on the type of injury, you may have a type of thing where the area of the brain that's responsible for making our cerebral spinal fluid may be damaged. Right. And it doesn't know to stop making the CSF and therefore sure. you might have extra fluid made. Um, but it really just depends on the injury. And those concussions we're hearing a lot about lately, CTE, football, I mean, there just seems to be a lot of correlation there, uh, a lot of cases, so so that's interesting. So it's like a bruise effect. You, I would see just like a dark spot on, on the brain, is that? Not what? necessarily, okay. it's probably more of a microscopic type oh, of a I thing. Oh, I see, okay, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah, wow, and then incredible. clearly what's interesting too is that because the brain floats, a concussion isn't necessarily just the brain hitting the front or the back or the sides right, of the right. skull. Depending on the type of impact, the brain actually might twist a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so depending on the symptoms that the person reveals, right. might tell you which part of the brain was actually Got damaged. It. Okay. Yeah. And just so our audience at home, this brain weighs about three pounds. And I'm just curious, Andrea, how do you keep it in such good condition? Is it formaldehyde? How do you, what, what do you put it in? So it was originally uh, fixed or pickled right. in formaldehyde. Okay. And then long-term storage, it's just kept in a salt solution, which salt is very solution. safe. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you for showing yeah, us that. Absolutely. Yeah, looks like absolutely. We have... And I just want to show you, um, if you were to take a brain and cut it in half, mm -hmm. this is what you would see on oh, the inside. Okay. Right. So we all have this big hole called the ventricle. Mm -hmm. The structure that Ventricle. makes mm -hmm. um, the CSF is located in this area. Okay. It's a very important structure called the choroid plexus. This structure is also a very important structure here. This is called the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is the bridge between the two hemispheres. I see. So if you sort of see how this is all solid right here, you see that the brain doesn't actually attach side to side until you get to this bridge. Right. In this area is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the area in the brain um, where a lot of our memory um, is stored mm -hmm. and also the area of the brain that's very highly affected in Alzheimer's disease. Wonderful. So the Thank plaques you. and tangles all Got form it. in these areas. Yeah. So if you were to take this whole brain and cut it like a loaf of bread, right. you would reveal these types of um, pieces of, of brain here. Mm -hmm. And what I want to show you since um, we don't have an Alzheimer's whole brain, um, we'll talk a little bit about these two. So one of the things I mentioned earlier is about the atrophy that occurs in the brain. Right. And when you're looking at a brain in this sort of um, form here, the ventricles are an area you can see straight away that change. Right. So in one of these, the ventricles are quite large. Mm -hmm. In the other, they look what we would call normal. Right. This one where the ventricles are quite large, this is an Alzheimer's brain. So I you see. see how enlarged they are. Mm -hmm. And that is because the tissue around it is shrinking. Right. And another area that you can sort of look at and make a determination, sort of what we call in a gross anatomical perspective, is the area that goes all the way around the outside of the brain, that sort of darker color. Yes. We call that the gray matter. Okay. It's quite thick and sort of evenly dispersed around. If you look at this Alzheimer's brain, in many areas, that gray matter has shrunken away. It's very, very thin. Right. And that also is a very clear indication that this person probably had Alzheimer's disease. And is this something that can be detected through x-ray or you know, in the diagnosis stage? So the way it works is that we clearly can get sort of a perspective looking at an MRI. Mm -hmm. We also are using PET scans now to see if someone has the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, in particular the plaques, the amyloid. Um, however, 
definitive diagnosis of the disease only occurs after the person has passed away. Oh, wow. And a neuropathologist has had an opportunity to microscopically examine the brain. I see. And then that individual sort of makes the final determination. And this is really important, Andrea. So in, in the future, the next decade or so, of all the incredible research you're doing here in the lab, how, how could we potentially find a way to make a diagnosis without my, the aftermath. Right. My guess will be that in the future, imaging will really sort of link us to a closer, more, you know, definitive diagnosis, if that's right. the word we want to use. Right. Um, looking at the tissue through a microscope, though, really tells you what's going on at those levels that we'll never really probably be able to visualize through imaging, at least right. not now, mm -hmm. but we are getting much, much better at right. making sort of clinical determinations of Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And any thought to resources and areas of support that you're looking for in the next few years? What's important to you? Well, clearly bringing um, high-end imaging facilities to the campus, we do have some of those, but um, that would be one direction. And another area is just support for recruiting high-level, cutting-edge researchers who mm -hmm. are going to break all those doors open for us. Wonderful. And so funds to do that kind of thing would be amazing. Awesome. Well, we will do our best to support that. Thank awesome. you. And so what else do we have here today? Well, the, this is just another half of this brain. Oh, the other so, half of the yeah, brain. Yeah, and that yeah. was really to show you right. sort the of, other, you know, if we well, were going right. to, you know, put a brain together, yes. you know, like this and there take is. it apart, sure. it's what you see. Got it. Right. The only other thing I wanted to show you, which is more of just an interesting specimen. Yes. Um, and we like to show this to people because it's very rare. This is a human spinal cord. And um, it's not really affected in Alzheimer's disease, but I often get questions about, you know, paralysis and that kind of sure. a thing. Um, the spinal cord is literally a bundle of nerves. And if you actually look down here. Mm -hmm. it almost looks like pasta. It looks like, like spaghetti. Angel yep, yep, yeah, exactly. So oh. these are actual nerves. Those are these nerves. Are actual wow. nerves that are coming off the spinal oh. cord. And so the whole system, the nervous system, um, if you look at it like this, clearly this is how it goes. Spinal cord connecting to the brain stem. And the brain and the, and, and the spinal cord all sit in cerebral spinal fluid. It's a closed system. Your brain knows how much CSF to make. And we right. have those big vertebrae in our back, those big bones, that surround the spinal cord and protect it. And again, when we talk about people who have paralysis, a lot of people talk about someone broke their back or their spinal cord was severed. Right. So breaking your back just means the bones The bones broke, broke. right. It may be that your spinal cord was fine. Mm -hmm. The other thing too is it's very rare that a spinal cord actually gets severed and cut. Right. Normally it's a contusion, not unlike a concussion, where you have maybe a crushing of the spinal cord or a bruise on the spinal cord. Right. And clearly very devastating. Sure. Uh, because what happens is that in those types of injuries, you are removing the free flowing of information up and down. You're creating a roadblock. And so therefore, if you have something down low, the information that's going on in your lower body isn't getting up to the brain and vice versa. Wow, and you I've, have I've never seen it this way. So if there is some sort of pressure here, can that be released and then that information can continue? It, it depends on the type of injury. Some people do recover right. because the injury wasn't so devastating. But yeah, one of the things that we have folks looking at is how do you repair that bridge so right. that the highway of information can return. The highway of information. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you for showing that to You're us. You're very welcome. Great. Well, thank you so much, Andrea, for that insightful tour and demonstration and giving us a little bit of perspective inside the brain. And, you know, for our community at the Internet Marketing Association, these are the types of shows that we want to bring to you. Individuals making impact on their industry, on their career, and we hope you've learned. And Andrea, uh, any follow-up? What's the best way for our audience to get in touch with BioSci and UCI Mind? Any uh, website or? Sure. We do have a website. It's www.mind.uci.edu. Awesome. Well, thank you again for that insight, and thank you for tuning into our fourth episode. We look forward to coming back to you in a month.